Hello everyone and welcome back to another video in this series all about the Cambridge B1 PET exam. In today's video, I'm going to talk about some of the grammar points that you need to know at B1 level. So if you're preparing for your exam, keep watching and hopefully these tips are useful for you. Before we get into the grammar, I would like to introduce you all to someone very special for me. <laughs> this is my little at-home production assistant. Okay, my challenge for you. Can you guess her name? If you have any ideas, leave me a comment down below. And throughout the video, I will be giving you some hints and some clues. So keep an eye out and an ear out for those. They might appear in the presentation or in the video. Essentially, you need to be able to talk about the present, the past, and the future. So to do that, we have the past, uh, the present simple, the present continuous, and the present perfect. Past simple, past continuous, future simple, and the future with going to. Okay, so with those structures, you, you should be able to obtain a good pass at a B1 level. Comparatives and superlatives are something that you should be able to use fairly accurately at B1 level. So let's start with comparatives. These are words, phrases that are used to compare two things. Typically, they're formed by adding er at the end of the adjective. So for example, I am bigger than my dog. <laughs> there are there are some rules and some exceptions to this and however the er at the end of the adjective is is fairly standard the the most common exception is for adjectives that are longer that contain three or more syllables for example the the word beautiful okay beautiful three syllables so instead of saying beautifuler no, no, don't say that. We say more beautiful. Superlatives are typically used to compare three or more um, objects or things and say which one of those is unique or special in some way. For example, Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world. So you, you might notice that the structure has the followed by the adjective, in this case, high, and the suffix est. Okay, so that's the, the typical structure. The adjective est, the highest, the smallest, the biggest, etc. Now, as with the comparatives, for the superlatives with and longer adjectives like beautiful, as we saw previously, we can't say the beautifulest. Instead, we say the most beautiful. There are always some exceptions to the rule. And um, some of these are related to the spelling of words. Uh, for example, we often change words that end in Y. We change the Y to an I before we add the, the suffix. I'll show you, I'm sure you can see in some examples here. Um, there are also exceptions with good and bad, okay? So good instead it does not become gooder in the comparative, it becomes better. And in the superlative, best, okay? Good, better, best. And then if we inverse it and look at the negative, we have bad, worse, and worst. Something else that you are expected to be able to use and apply correctly at B1 level uh, is modal verbs, okay? So these are auxiliary verbs that are typically used to express ability, possibility, uh, what else, necessity, permission, 
Okay, they have, they have different functions and sometimes the function can change depending on the context. So I've made a list here for you of some of the most common modal verbs that you should be able to use and their functions. Um, during the exam, it's important that you demonstrate a selection of these, okay? So try not to overuse can and could. And this is something I often see from students. Prepositions. <laughs> For me, this graphic like, illustrates it perfectly. And um, here we can see on the left hand side, the prepositions of time and on the right, the prepositions of place. And you can see they follow that structure in, on, at. In, we use for very general times, very general places. For example, in 1990 or in Spain. Okay, we're talking about in a big country or in a year, very general. Then we get a little more specific. On, we could use with a specific day or a specific date. So on the 7th of January or on, if we're referring to places, we could say on a street. Okay, so on high street or on the corner. So we're again a little more specific. And then if we go even more specific down to the point, we have at. So at we use for specific times and um, specific house numbers within a street. Uh, for example, at seven o'clock or at number 10 Downing Street. Um, articles. These are small but very important words that we use constantly throughout the day in our speaking, writing, communication in general. Small but important. We have first the, the indefinite article. By that I mean a or an. A we use before a, a word that starts with a consonant. For example, a potato. And an we use before a word that starts with a vowel an apple or the pronunciation of the first syllable of a word may not may be a consonant but pronounced like a vowel so we're listening for the pronunciation not necessarily the spelling so i'm thinking like the word honest starts with a consonant but is pronounced with an o o sound so in that case we say an honest person, not a honest person. Next, we have the definite article. By this, I mean the. <laughs> we use this word when we already know what it is we are referring to. So, for example, um, I saw a movie yesterday. The movie was fantastic. And finally, no article, okay? We, we don't use a, an, or the. Usually this is because we're referring to very general situations or general things or general ideas, okay? In that case, we omit the article. Uh, for example, I love music, okay? We don't say I love the music. Mm -mm. Conditionals, yay! <laughs> That was sarcasm. Um, chances are, if you have been studying English for a little while, you will have encountered the conditionals. Now, in English, we have a total of four conditionals. Uh, zero, one, two, and three. Don't ask me why they start with zero. That seems silly, but hey -ho, here we are. At B1 level, you are not expected to use the third conditional. Um, and the second conditional I have included on the presentation um, because you might want to try and use it. However, it's not a necessity. Zero conditional is essentially used to talk about universal truths, facts, things that are just always true. And um, such as if you mix red and yellow, 
you get orange. So we have the structure of present simple and the second part, present simple. <laughs> there we go. First conditional. This we use to talk about probable situations. Okay, so these are, they're not impossible, but they're not certain. Uh, for example, if I study hard, I will pass my exam. Okay, we notice the structure. If I study, present simple, followed by I will pass my exam, the future simple with will. Okay, the verb with will. Unfortunately, that's not a certainty, but it is probable. If you study, you probably will pass your exam. And the second conditional. And uh, like I said, this is not a necessity to have, to be able to use at B1 level, but is certainly going to give you an advantage if you can. So maybe try to include it um, or prepare some, some phrases that you could incorporate into your exam. This, this structure is typically used to talk about hypothetical, um, not impossible situations, but perhaps improbable. Hypothetical and improbable. Like, if I won the lottery, I would travel the world. Okay, we notice the structure there. If I won the lottery, here we have the verb in the past simple. I would travel the world. Okay, I would, and then the verb in the infinitive. Yes, back. Okay, so um, I'll give you one last clue. There is a famous dish from Scotland called haggis, neeps, and her name is Tatty, which in Scotland means potato. <laughs> so this is Tatty, my little potato. <laughs> nice to meet everyone. Say hi, Tatty. Adjectives that end in ed or ing. And by that, I mean to know the difference and be able to use correctly bored and boring, interested and interesting, annoyed and annoying. So, what's the difference? The adjectives that end in ed are, they describe a feeling or a sensation that, that is caused by, by a situation. Okay, so for example, I am bored. Whereas the adjectives that end in ing, boring, they normally refer to the, the situation or the activity that causes that feeling. I am bored because the class is boring. Hopefully not something you ever say about your English classes, but you never know. Okay, so that's a, for me, that's a good, good way to remember it. I am bored, the class is boring. I am annoyed, my sister is annoying. <laughs> So when we use the adjective with ing, it doesn't matter if it is a person, an activity, uh, I don't know, a uh, situation, but that's, that's the thing that is causing the feeling for the other person, okay? I am annoyed because my sister, although she is a person, she is annoying to me. That is everything I have for today. So. As always, I hope this video has been somewhat useful for you. Please do leave us a comment down below. Let me know if you think, if you can think of anything else that should be included in this list, or if you have any questions about the points that I talked about today. I do read the comments, so I will respond to you as, as soon as I can. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and hit that little notification icon so that you'll get an alert for the next videos we have coming up in this series. See you later, bye.